Hello and welcome to today's Fort Pitt Capital's webinar series. Today we're going to hear thoughts from our Fort Pitt Capital Investment Management team. They'll share with us their outlook on the year of 2022 and answer questions that we gathered uh, directly from our clients uh, as, as people registered and logged on. Uh, here at Fort Pitt Capital, we help clients make decisions with their portfolios in all market environments. Uh, we employ a process to get to know clients just as well as the companies that we invest in. Our mission is to provide clients with solutions to their financial concerns, alleviating, alleviating them of the burden of day-to-day -day management in order to help them make the most out of their assets. Once we get to know you, we can tailor recommendations and advice specifically to your situation. We have many different webinars and topics to help you, uh, not just with your financial planning, uh, but also uh, to help you bring everything else into balance. Soon we'll host another webinar with Chris and Laura to discuss healthy eating and stress. Uh, but we want you to know that we can be a trusted partner to help with all the situations clients may encounter. And we have a great network of other professionals we can work with to help clients through many different situations. We frequently work with other CPAs, attorneys, and healthcare professionals to help clients through many different uh, situations that they encounter. Just a little bit about myself. I'm one of the advisors here at Fort Pitt Capital and I really enjoy working with clients because I get to learn just as much from them as they do from me. I have many clients uh, in different fields and industries and all different walks of life all across the country. So I enjoy hearing their stories and about their families, uh, their different experience and how they accumulated their wealth. Then I get to be a partner with them to develop a strategy and ensure that they have the best opportunity to meet their next set of goals and objectives. Uh, today's guests are uh, Chief Investment Officer, Dan I. Uh, he's responsible for Fort Pitt Capital's overall investment uh, style and strategy. Also joining us is uh, Portfolio Manager Carter. Uh, he is an integral piece of our in-house portfolio construction. Uh, we did plan on having Jay here with us this afternoon. Uh, he's a little bit under the weather, so he's uh, staying home, but we'll be able to have more of his insights a little bit uh, later on in future webinars. We gathered a lot of questions uh, ahead of the uh, webinar, and I've tried to categorize them into different categories. So you might not hear your exact question, but we think that a lot of the uh, questions are gonna bring out the answers uh, that, that people wanted to hear. If you have questions as we go along, uh, here's where you can click inside the webinar if you're on a desktop or on your device, and we can get those questions real time. And if we don't get to your question today, um, then I will uh, have your financial advisor follow up with you uh, at a more uh, appropriate time and, and go into more detail with you. So with that, uh, we're eager to get started. Um, we wanted to make this conversational. Um, and so we're going to talk with uh, Dan and Carter. Um, Dan and Carter took over on January 1st as part of our plan transition as portfolio managers for the strategies. Uh, Charlie Smith was here for 20 years uh, and helped a lot of people and just wanted to um, uh, hear Charlie and Carter's thoughts as we start the, the new year and, and take Fort Pitt Capital into 2022. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. It's it's great to spend some time with you today. Um, first, just to follow up on on David's uh, comments, wanted to give some you know some kudos to to Charlie as as David mentioned. You know, Charlie passed that that baton or, or management responsibilities uh, over to, to to Carter and and myself at the beginning of the year. Uh, well said, Dan. I, I would just jump in. I mean. You know, I'm extremely lucky lucky to have started my career under Charlie. Um, he really shaped the way that I think about investing in business. You know, when I first came here as a young 24 year old, my investing style was more quantitative number crunching. But you know, Charlie really guided me to to mix that with the more qualitative aspects of investing. Uh, to think more like a business owner and capture that equity premium. You know, understand the people behind the company and think about the company's products and, and brands 10 years from now. So. Um, even as he transitions, his philosophy, his thoughts are still echoing through these halls. Terrific. Good. Thank you for that. And you know, with that in mind, let's turn our attention to how we finished up 2021 and what happened during the year and uh, what you see playing playing out in 2022. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, David. Um, I think as far as a you know a recap of of 2021, obviously, you know, a great year for stocks. The you know, broad equity markets up, let's say between, you know, 24 and, and 29%. You 
you know, economic growth really, you know, roared back as, as the reopening process continued. You know, the employment picture improved dramatically and really, you know, unprecedented, uh, you know, fiscal stimulus left the, the consumer really well supported. And say equity markets also, you know, keyed off of the extremely accommodative stance from the, you know, from the Federal Reserve, which not only kept you know, interest rates at, at zero throughout the year, but also, um, you know, flooded the market with with liquidity through their aggressive, you know, bond buying program. And and finally, um, you know, extremely impressive corporate earnings growth is, as well. You know, we don't have the final numbers for 2021, but it looks as though, you know, S&P 500 companies grew their aggregate earnings somewhere around, you know, 50% compared to 2020. So probably a lot more I could cover on 2021, but I think those are some of the, you know, some of the high points. Uh, as far as, you know, the new year, you know, it's it's more of a, of a mixed bag in, in our view. We do expect to see, you know, a continuation of, of above tr trend economic growth, you know, as the, con the economy continues to, to normalize. And we should have another year of, of you know, healthy growth in, uh, in corporate profits. Estimates right now are around the, you know, 9 to 10% uh, growth level for 2022. You know, we think that, you know, those estimates could even prove, you know, could even prove to be, to be conservative. But, you know, we're also aware of, of the challenges we'll face this year as well. I'd say first being that, you know, the market's just done so well over the past, you know, three years. Um, you know, if we look back to the beginning of 2019 through the end of 2020, you know, the broad market for the S&P 500 was up, you know, 100%. So um, obviously well above historical average returns. It's left us in a situation where, you know, valuations are, are high and uh, more of a challenging, you know, starting point for the, for the year. Um, and then, you know, I think we're seeing a changing, you know, backdrop with the, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve or, or monetary policy um, expectations now are that the, you know, the Fed could hike interest rates three or four times in 2022. You know, obviously a much different backdrop compared to the, you know, the environment investors have gotten used to over the last uh, couple years. And then there's the risk that, you know, price pressures don't subside um, as anticipated with, you know, inflation and higher interest rates taking a you know more meaningful bite out of out of you know corporate profits and, and valuation multiple. So I think that's a long-winded way of saying that you know we think that the, the risk to reward dynamics look a lot more balanced this year. And you know as a result we we expect more modest, you know, normalized, you know, single digit type of, of returns for for broad equity markets this year. Rick, yeah, that that is a, a a lot to digest, and and you know, I know the market is changing very quickly, especially in the last couple of days and weeks. But you know, where where do you see equity valuations right at this moment? Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, you know, they're they're high, but to to put that into into context, <clears throat> you know, if we look at the current valuation of let's use the S and P five hundred as a as a proxy. You know, it's trading at about a 15% premium to, you know, long-term 25-year averages. Uh, but I think there's certainly a number of, of pretty important caveats there as, as well. Um, you know, obviously low interest rates justify, you know, higher valuations, at least, at least to some degree. Um, you know, the weighting of, of an index like the S&P is, is very, very heavily dominated by you know, the mega cap technology stocks, which trade at, at fairly high, you know, valuation multiples and tends to, you know, skew the valuation of the of the overall market. But, you know, most importantly for, for us is that, you know, our investment opportunities aren't constrained or limited to the broad market indices. You know, we have the ability to be selective when it comes to, you know, which which sectors or which individual stocks you know, we're investing in, we're able to be selective in terms of, you know, which valuations we're comfortable with and, and which ones we aren't. Yeah. And, and like you said before, we've had market returns very favorable in the last couple of years. So a lot of clients have approached us with index funds or mutual funds that have done very well. I think, um, you know, 
a professor in Texas dubbed what's happening with a lot of employees now the great resignation. So a lot of people looked at their 401ks and saw that there's more there and maybe decided to retire early. We helped a couple of those this, this year. But um, Carter, can you talk a little bit about the historical valuation of say those growth or momentum mutual funds versus say value stocks and just give us some context for where you believe we are today and, and how that could play out for the rest of the year? Sure, Dave. Well, it, it's no secret that the last decade has favored growth in, in almost every year. Um, we've had a period of, of low interest rates, free money, uh, asset purchases from the Fed, and it's really pushed out the risk curve and the risk tolerance for investors and favored what I call long duration assets or you know, assets where the value comes in and more distant cash flows. And that's your that's growth stocks. So I'd also add that a little bit of, of FOMO and then the retail cohort, you know, trying to hit, hit the next big thing has also driven some growth valuations to astronomical levels. Um, today we are seeing um, you know, the environment change, higher interest rates are on the way. Um, and inflation really cut into those higher multiples of growth stocks. I mean, we look at the market right now, NASDAQ is down almost 50%. Some of those higher multiple growth names down 50% year to date already. Um, so we, what we're seeing now is a little bit of this rotation into value or you know, higher quality assets, more predictable cash flows, more reliable cash flows. And really for my outlook into 2022, I think this narrative um, is gonna stick as we've seen throughout the first you know, month here. I think value is going to have its, uh, its day in the sun this year. Terrific. Yeah, and I think you hear a lot when we talk about our different strategies that we have that value tilt. So the market is moving to what's more favorable for, for what we're doing. But are all the strategies that we have here value oriented or do we have other strategies that the clients could use if they wanted to participate in some of those other areas as well? Sure. And for those clients that, that aren't aware, we, we, we recently launched our unconstrained equity portfolio late last year. Uh, this portfolio has significant growth or what I like to call an innovator's component to it. Um, historically, our value tilt meant, you know, we favored uh, great business models, predictable cash flow, great management team. Um, but the unconstrained equity still has that same philosophy. Um, instead, we, uh, you know, we're willing to pay a little more in valuation to maybe delay or extend our duration of cash flows in favor of you know, higher growth on the top line with the expectation that that you know, will convert into higher profits later. Um, and I, I'd like to just take a step back. I mean, we hear so much about this growth versus uh, value narrative, uh, you know, but really the way that, that I think about it personally, it, you know, I look at it as the haves versus the have nots. And you, know, you can find a solid value company growing top line revenue by you know, 20 to 30% a year that trades closer to you know, more of a market multiple because, you know, maybe it's overlooked or maybe it's implementing something that the market hasn't captured yet. But then on the flip side, there's also a ton of growth companies that, you know, aren't growing that get higher multiples because, you know, they're in a certain area of, of the market that is growing or they're, or they're tied to a competitor that's, uh, you know, growing quickly. So I just wanted to, to kind of shed light on that clarity of, of growth versus value. So, um, you know, we look at the broad spectrum of the market and, you know, aren't just pigeonholed to one sector. That's great. Yeah, and we have a couple different ways to address that and, and help clients uh, participate in, in both sides. And so, you know, we got a lot of questions about inflation and when we're building our, our, our plans and you're talking a few years out, uh, but we try to model in what different inflation rates will be. So our planning department uh, actually late last year increased the amount of uh, money that we are going to tell our clients, you know, they're going to need to spend in retirement because of inflation. So we've adjusted that when we build their retirement plans. Um, where do you guys see supply and demand now and, and where do you see uh, inflation ultimately going? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, David. And, and obviously, you know, a lot of, I'd say, diverging opinions on, on the inflation topic. And, and I think it's, you know, it's a little difficult to have or to be, you know, too convicted in, in your view on inflation, just given the, the unprecedented situation. You know, we have headline in, inflation levels at at 7%. You know, we, we haven't seen that since, you know, the early 1980s. And I'd say also, you know, many of the of the contributors to, to inflation, you know, this time around are, are a lot, you know, different as, as well. I'd say my view is that you know inflation levels you know will decline throughout the year, 
but you know, we're not going back to the you know subdued you know two percent level that you know we got used to in the in the ten or twelve years um, you know before the the pandemic. So my guess is that we'll end you know 2022 with you know inflation readings in the in the three to four percent range. And you know I point to a number of of you know reasons for that expectation. You know we think that supply chains will you know unclog, especially as we as we transition you know to the endemic stage of of COVID, which I think is a really good you know baseline as, assumption. I think it's very safe to say that we'll see dramatically lower you know fiscal stimulus in 2022 compared to the last two years. Um, you know the Fed has told us that they have you know they are pivoting towards you know trying to cool inflation as opposed to you know reflating the the economy <laughs> and i also haven't forgotten about you know some of the just long term structural factors that have kept inflation low for a very long period of time you know things like aging demographics globalization automation and and high debt levels you know those certainly haven't gone away so while i do expect you know some inflation components such as wages and and rents will you know remain elevated for some time i think the overall inflation uh you know levels will will normalize somewhat throughout the year okay great so yeah like i mentioned a lot of questions nick ed john wayne they all had questions about inflation and how long will it last so if it does persist the way that you think and a client wanted to take step, steps to address that outcome you know, what strategy would you recommend to complement an existing portfolio that was looking to add more income well, I would expect our our dividend appreciation strategy to do particularly well in that in that environment or with that that outcome. Although I think it's positioned well to do do fine in, in, in a lot of different environments. But you know, this is a portfolio of of thirty you know high quality stocks, very reasonable valuations that that pay attractive dividend yields. But I think there are a number of of aspects that you know, really kind of differentiate our, our strategy from other, you know, dividend or, or high dividend yield uh, approaches. You know, we're investing in companies that are showing, you know, solid top and, and bottom line, you know, earnings growth, which we expect to, to continue in the future. You know, we're not loaded up with, you know, telecom and, and utility stocks that, you know, certainly pay good yields, but struggle to, to grow their bottom lines. And you know it's also much more diversified with with more exposure to higher growth um, sectors in areas like healthcare and uh, technology and and financials. Um, you know these are businesses that generate a lot of cash, which allows you know them to grow their dividend payments and, and give investors you know a raise every year. And you know that's exactly what you want in an inflationary environment. You know you want companies that you're investing in to be able to grow. And, and increase their their dividends in in uh, in excess of of, in, of inflation levels. Um, so you know I think that's certainly what we've what we've strived to achieve in this portfolio. Certainly not what you get with you know fixed rate bonds where you know coupon payments are are locked in and and don't increase with uh, with inflation and and market interest rates. Terrific. That sounds like it really could help add more income for. For clients that are looking for for that, um, and you know, as you guys mentioned, there's a lot of of market performance that has done very well over the last couple of years. We do have a lot of do-it-yourself investors that we've helped that have just experienced a lot of appreciation over the last couple of years, whether that's in their mutual funds, their 401ks, or or individual stocks. Um, so I think one of our competitive advantages is that we can you know evaluate an existing portfolio and then you know come up with a capital gains budget and a, create a plan to help them address the taxes that they they've had on their portfolio so carter can you describe a little bit about that process of how you evaluate a, a basket of mutual funds stocks etfs that a client might already have and uh, how you would take the capital gains that they already have in existing positions and take that into account when you shape one of our individual stock uh, strategies or multi-asset strategies Sure, and I would say, I mean, over the last decade, you've seen a, a great market to capture those gains. 
Um, I would say the days of kind of just throwing money in the market or any stock and it working are, are behind us. I believe that current market environment and the next five to 10 year market returns will probably pale in, in comparison to, to what we saw in the last decade. But you know, for us and, and really for everyone, evaluating portfolios or ETFs or mutual funds with large gains or losses is much more uh, of an art than a science. Um, there's no one exact way to handle it. Um, you know, if we see large concentrated positions with gains, I mean, the last thing we wanted, want to happen is, you know, some type of black swan event um, in that particular stock or in the market that wipes out, you know, years of appreciation. Um, so what we try to do is we work to pair it back um, into a reasonable way that doesn't stick the clients with any, you know, huge tax bill, you know, and this, this can take us years uh, to get that position down to, you know, a more manageable size. Um, but on the flip side of that, unless there are losses that we can offset, and, and we really do this at the end of uh, each year, we call it tax loss harvesting. Um, we ha do this process in December by selling assets at a loss to offset any gains. Uh, and if we like the asset, or if you like the asset, you know, we can buy it back in 32 days. Um, and if we don't, it's an added bonus, just getting it out of the portfolio and using those losses to offset any gains that we have. Great, yeah, and then you can get into more of Fort Pitt Capital's best ideas at the, at the time. Um, we got a lot of questions about the different sectors of the market. Uh, Chris and James, and I think Dom asked a question for his mom. Uh, he said, right or wrong, you know, the energy and financial sectors were some of the top sectors last year. Um, do you see that continuing for 2021? I'll grab that one, David. Um, so I'll tackle those one one by one. So you know, I still like the the financials. You know, it's one of the cheapest sectors in in the market, and and one that could be a really good, you know, hedge to to inflation and and rising interest rates. I would say on the on the other side of the coin, you know, the bar is set pretty high for for financials this year, just given such strong results in in 2021, and uh, they've made it. You know, all the big banks, at least, have made it pretty clear that, you know, spending and, and expenses will be, you know, elevated this year as, as the banks really build out their technology platforms. And, um, you know, they're dealing with with higher wage wage costs as, as well. So, you know, we, we like the sector. We like the businesses that we that we own. But, um, you know, certainly not calling for, you know, a repeat of of last year's, you know, call it 32 plus percent you know return from the from the broad sector um yeah i was gonna, as, I was gonna jump yeah, in on, on the energy part um you know i think you know energy has been a great performer uh you know last year even to start this year and i think the reason for that is because we've seen uh this rotation into quality assets and because you know these assets they have such predictable and reliable cash flows and, and earnings and i think that's why a lot of people uh, you know, float into those assets last year and even to begin this year. And and so when you look at all the different sectors, is, are there any others that you think might be a little more overvalued or undervalued at this point? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I, I still like the, the financials. Um, I like the healthcare sector. I think it just, it just really checks all the boxes in terms of, you know, valuation, growth, and, and income, you know, obviously very, very favorable tailwinds there in, in terms of, you know, demographics and, and an aging population. Um, and, you know, you have, you have some higher growth areas like medical devices and, and medical technology where, you know, you see that innovation that, that's in, as impressive as anything that I see in the, in the technology sector. And then you also have some really, you know, cheap areas of, of healthcare like pharmaceuticals, where you know fundamentals look look really solid, and um, you know many of those 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 stocks are trading at just downright cheap you know valuations. Um, also, really like how we're positioned within the the consumer discretionary space. You know, continue to think that that the uh, the home improvement sector looks looks attractive, and uh, also that you know there's there's plenty of room for you know the good hardline retailers you know that use you know technology really well and have built out a, a really strong you know omni-channel you know presence really to continue to to take market share away from um you know some of the retailers that 
you know, just just haven't evolved and, and frankly might, you know, might not be around for, for five or 10 years in the next five or 10 years. Terrific, thank you. And um, getting a couple questions as we as we talk here about inflation, gold, some of the things that the Fed are is doing. Uh, James wanted to know about fixed income and is there anything clients should be doing to hedge with inflation? And a lot of those questions also tie in gold. I mean, what do you think will happen with with gold for 2022? Yeah, so I, I heard uh, I heard some questions about about fixed income. So. Uh, I'll put my fixed income hat on and, and tackle that question since since Jay isn't able to be to be with us today. Um, but you know, first kind of an outlook on fixed income in, in general. I think you know last year we said that that fixed income investors you know would be lucky to earn their their coupons on their bonds, and uh, you know I think we'll stick with that that call here for for 2022. Uh, you know we've certainly been been fooled in the past, but we think that, you know, as Carter mentioned, interest rates are likely to grind higher in 2022, you know, driven by a number of factors, you know, interest rate hikes from the Federal Reserve, um, still elevated inflation levels, whether those cool off or not, we're, we're likely to see those be, you know, elevated compared to, to averages. And also from the, you know, the Federal Reserve backing away from, you know, their massive you know, $120 billion of bond purchases every month, which we think, you know, went a long way to, to keeping, you know, interest rates well, well contained. Um, so, you know, rising yields isn't a great backdrop for, for fixed income returns. You know, as far as hedging inflation, we think that the, you know, the equity side of the portfolio is really where you want to look to, to, you know, hedge against inflation by, you know, as I mentioned, you know, investing in companies that are able to, you know, grow their earnings at a faster clip than, than inflation. Um, but on the fixed income side, you know, I do want to keep duration uh, fairly short or, or set a different way, you know, invest way more heavily in, in shorter maturity bonds that aren't as impacted by rising interest rate as rates as, as longer maturity bonds are. Um, I also want to have, you know, somewhat of a laddered bond portfolio where, you know, a portion of the bonds in, in the portfolio are, are maturing every year so that we have the ability to, you know, reinvest those maturity proceeds at, at higher interest rates. Obviously, you know, no guarantee that that's the outcome, but, you know, if you do have that portion of your, of your bonds mature on a free, frequent basis, you know, you just have more bites at the apple, if you will, compared to someone who holds, you know, 20 or 30 year bonds that has the way to a very long time in order to, you know, kind of reset their their yields or take advantage of a of a higher interest rate environment. Um, also, heard some questions about about gold. I'll I'll tackle that. Carter can certainly jump in here if he if he'd like. But I guess the the first thing to mention is, you know, we we don't have any exposure to to gold in in portfolios, and I don't have a real, you know, firm pound the table uh, view on gold. Um, you know, I'm surprised that it hasn't hasn't performed better, you know, recently, actually, you know, down a little bit over the last 12 months or so, uh, really hasn't acted as that, you know, inflation hedge, at least in the in the current environment. Um, but I'd say one of the problems I really have with with gold, and I probably put, you know, crypto in this in this category as well, is that, you know, it doesn't generate any cash flow or earnings or dividends. And that makes it, you know, extremely difficult for you know fundamental analysts like us to you know put a fair value on the asset and say you know it's cheap and we should buy it or it's expensive and and we should should sell it so you know our preference is is to invest in you know companies that have the ability again to to grow uh, their earnings that can pay and increase dividends and we just don't get that with with gold Terrific. Yeah, and I, I do think that leads into some of the crypto questions that we were getting as as well. So people would love to hear your thoughts on that. It's uh, gaining a little more acceptance. Some companies will accept it as payment. Some will not. Uh, NTFs and things are growing in popularity. But uh, Carter, can you tell us, you know, what's the latest on on crypto from your perspective? Yeah. So I mean, we've seen obviously Bitcoin's the one that's most talked about, but 
you know, other cryptocurrencies have fallen 40, 50, 60 percent from all time highs uh, from from late November. So, you know, the volatility is still there, which tells me, um, you know, to Dan's point, this asset is not being used as as an inflation hedge or even a, a hedge at all. And is still probably a little bit more on the speculative side. Um, but, you know, honestly, I would not be surprised, um, you know, if Bitcoin is a, is a leading indicator in this market uh, environment. You know, I watched yesterday, Bitcoin fell really hard early morning, um, but rebounded around 10 a.m. before the stock market followed suit, you know, two hours later. So, you know, we've seen market corrections generally hit the most volatile, you know, speculative asset class first and trickle through. Um, but when the buying resumes, it usually begins uh, in assets hit the hardest. So, you know, I'm kind of looking at Bitcoin as uh, maybe a market indicator of, of when buying might resume. Um, but, you know, get to the underlying, you know, blockchain, you know, it's probably my favorite uh, innovation that, that we've seen over the last year. Um, you know, the rise in peer-to-peer -peer payments, the ease of payment processing. Um, I think it's astonishing what we've seen uh, and how blockchain has evolved. Um, more from just a peer-to-peer -peer payment platform uh, to something what now everyone is calling Web3 um, that includes smart contracts and that has given rise to, you know, the NFTs, the metaverse and decentralized online data. Terrific. And you started to lead in where I was going to go next there, Carter. I had asked a question that I thought was pretty good. Um, you know, if you think about where the world was back in 2020, there was a lot of... Uh, Things we didn't know about the pandemic and things have worked out just fine. The market has returned uh, pretty well. Businesses have found ways to do more with less and employees missing time. But uh, Pat asks, what, what do you see as the top three disruptors in the post-pandemic uh, recovery? Are there any examples like you cited with the peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, for innovations that you were per particularly Im impressed with that you know we might in the future add to our portfolio? Sure. Well, I'd say, you know, contactless payment and, and blockchain is, is probably my favorite. Um, you know, some others that, you know, we've looked at and that, you know, I'm pretty excited about, I would say, you know, data integration for machine learning and AI. Uh, we've seen more companies, especially over the pandemic, adopting um, and trying to gain any type of competitive advantage they can by, you know, whether that's making decisions faster or with more data. Um, we really like what's going on in that space. Um, others, we like automation technology and warehousing. Um, as Dan alluded to earlier in his comments, the supply chain disruptions that we have seen have been just extraordinary. Um, that's why we see some type of warehouse automation, factory robots, you know, what they have done to alleviate timing pressures has been awesome um, innovation to see. And then, you know, the last one that I can throw out there is probably just, you know, cloud computing. Um, you know, during the pandemic and even during the lockdowns, right, we saw almost the whole workforce working from home. And a lot of companies were forced to send their companies, um, you know, to work from home. And if you didn't have any type of, you know, cloud infrastructure um, inside your company, and if it was all on hardware, um, then it was very hard to do business operations. So, you know, we still think that transition is probably, um, you know, still in the midst and probably only halfway done. Uh, so that's another place that we would look for is cloud computing. Terrific. And um, Dan, how about you? What are some, some you know, green shoots uh, in the, you know, whether it's the market, the economy, or what's going on that, that give you optimism for this year? I, th I think there are plenty of, you know, of, of positives to be, to be optimistic about and to be in, encouraged by, um, you know, markets and, and investors might not be <coughs> Focusing on those factors in the first, you know, three three weeks of the of the year, but they're out there. Um, and I think the first one for me would be uh, the consumer. You know, the real driver of of the U.S. economy is is in really good shape. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, we heard from, you know, Jamie Dimon, the the CEO of the of the world's largest bank, that you know said he's never seen a a stronger consumer. Um, you know, and if you look at their their balance sheets and savings levels, I think it's really hard to to argue with them. Um, our banks are in you know rock solid shape, very well capitalized, you know, very well positioned to continue to to lend and and support the the economy. Um, I think you have to be impressed with you know again some of the comments that Carter made. You know how well businesses 
and entrepreneurs, you know, adapted to the new realities uh, that came with the, the pandemic. You know, companies that didn't have a really strong online presence, you know, built one in a matter of, of months. You know, businesses like ours, you know, were able to just quickly adapt to being able to, you know, service our, our clients virtually, you know, almost overnight. Um, we saw a record amount of of small businesses get started in the depths of the of the uncertainty, um, you know, caused by the the pandemic and and the shutdowns. So I think that those are some of the things in the in the near term. But you know, more importantly, over the over the long term, you know, I'm optimistic as long as you know people wake up every day wanting to you know better their standard of living, wanting to do more, you know, wanting to earn more wanting to consume more and you know that they realize that the way to you know accomplish those goals is to you know add value to to their companies they, that they work for or their own businesses and you know i don't see that dynamic changing anytime soon david okay. I, I would add I, I think at least what i'm looking at I, I think one of the biggest economic factors that that we see recovering uh maybe probably in the second half of this year is the supply chain disruptions um, as Dan alluded to earlier, you know, with COVID easing into summer months, companies, you know, really adapting to demand and supply constraints. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a big factor that we've seen um, impacting inflation and, and prices everywhere. Um, and then I, I'd also add that, you know, what should happen from the Fed this year, um, in my eyes, is a good thing for the market. You know, there was, there is and was a lot of rampant speculation that, that needed to be corrected out of the market. Um, if left, you know, too long or, you know, untamed, it could have disastrous consequences for the overall market. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just, you know, I would just tag on to that a little bit, you know, about the, the, the speculation in the mar market. I mean, I don't know about you, Carter, but I, I kind of felt like the, you know, the old granddad in the rocking chair on the, on the porch, um, when we would get questions from, from clients about some of these, you know, initial public offerings. And uh, you know some of these SPACs that, that came out in the in the summertime. I mean, you know, I know you and I just couldn't you know couldn't wrap our, our heads around the, the the valuations or just the you know ex extremely excessive assumptions that were you know kind of being used to to support those those prices. Um, you know, I think investors that have you know bought into a lot of those those uh, you know those trends and those. Those opportunities over the the summertime have certainly, you know, felt some pain and and learned some some lessons. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, the public markets are a very efficient system, and we've seen, you know, some of the spacs, uh, you know, from their all time highs, the spac index is down, you know, some forty percent from where it was, um, and we've even seen, you know, some of the other ETFs that are more, uh, you know, growth oriented and innovators who are down, you know, twenty to thirty percent this year already. Yeah, so we're already starting to see that that play out. Guys, a lot of great thoughts and a, a couple more questions that just kind of came in as we were talking. You know, they we talked a lot about inflation today. You know, one asked about inflation in other countries. Um, and, you know, we have the Fed meeting coming up in the next couple of days to talk about what the Fed's going to do to unwind that here. Uh, but, but questions about, you know, how other countries, the rest of the world will handle it. And then also, you know, domestic, com you know, domestic performance has, has beaten international performance for the past couple of years. Do you see that trend changing, David asked? Do you think it's possible European markets could outperform U.S. markets in 2022? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one, David. Um, yeah, I mean, we've seen a very long trend of, of U.S. companies out, outperforming, you know, developed Europe as, especially. Um, and I don't want to take a real hard, hard view on what happens necessarily this year, but what I will say is that, um, you know, when we look at the at the structure of, let's say, the, the U.S. market, such as the S&P 500 versus a developed international market, you know, you see a, a, a huge divergence in in sector exposure. You know, our markets are are probably something like, you know, 35 to, to 40 percent in, you know, technology or or technology like sectors like communication services, whereas that's you know, five or ten percent of of most you know developed international markets. So I think you know we really need for to see international markets outperform. I think you really need to see 
you know, dramatic underperformance of, of the technology space in, in the U.S. We're seeing some of that, some of that now. But over the long term, you know, when we look at, you know, profit margins on U.S. companies, when we look at return on assets and, and return on, on equity for U.S. companies, they're just more efficient than, than they are in, in Europe or, or Japan. So I think for the, for the long term, in order for that trend to, to really change, you know, these other countries, you know, are going to start having to eat our lunch when it comes to, when, when it comes to innovation and uh, efficiency and, and profitability. And um, I don't necessarily see see that coming. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too, Dan. I think, you know, I'm not going to add too much. I think you hit, hit the nail on the head there. But, you know, we've seen emerging markets kind of already outperform this year. Um, and, and sometimes they do better in, in rising interest rate environments. And, you know, honestly, we've already seen some uh, emerging markets and international uh, countries actually cut rates, uh, you know, while the United States is heading in the opposite direction. But, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how the debt markets play out. Uh, we saw the IMF come out and you know kind of hint towards companies that that do have some dollar denominated debt or a lot of it that you know interest rates are going up and um, you know maybe now's a time to offload that from the balance sheets. Yeah, and David, I think maybe one part of that that question that we didn't that we didn't cover was you know what does the inflation picture look like in in other in other countries? You know, I think we're at something like a 40-year high in terms of, of headline inflation in the in the U.S. and in, in Europe, it's something like a you know a 30-year high. So they're they're feeling it as as well. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with you know Carter mentioned supply chains, and that's certainly a big a big part of it. But we we've also seen just a huge divergence between you know the demand for goods, which is very high, and the demand for for services, which is you know, kind of below below average is you know really attributable to you know still to the to the pandemic. So as that as those demand supply and demand um, you know balance out between goods and goods and services, I think that helps a lot on the uh, on the inflationary side as well. And you know the other thing I would mention is that <clears throat> as we all know, you know we're very dependent on um, you know production in in China and, and Southeast Asia broadly. And, um, you know, we've seen a very different uh, kind of COVID policy in, in China and, and other parts of, of Southeast Asia. You know, I think in the U.S. we've kind of come to terms that, you know, it's part of the backdrop and we're going to have to, you know, live with, with COVID for, for some time. That's a much different policy than a, you know, a zero tolerance for, for COVID when you shut down, you know, manufacturing when you have, you know, a small outbreak of of COVID, and that's really impacted supply chains. I think I think we're starting to see you know some of those Asian com countries start to kind of rethink uh, that rethink that policy, which should also you know help on the on the inflation side. Terrific. But I, I think you've addressed a lot of the questions and a lot of things that people had top of mind. So great to hear your thoughts, and I really appreciate you guys sharing your your insights with us. Um, I want to close also by thanking everybody for all the interest and the great questions. Um, if there are more specific questions you have, and there were a few that came through um, that uh, I know we didn't get it, it to address, but we can uh, address them through your advisor and we will reach out to you to make sure we get all of your questions uh, answered. And um, we do have that next webinar coming up on February 24th with Chris Cheney and, and Laura Zeros. Uh, talking about healthy eating and how to combat uh, stress. So thank you, uh, and also, oh, also happy to help anyone that, that might need advice. Um, you can have confidence, anyone you refer to Fort Pitt Capital, uh, we're gonna take good care of them and, and help them build a plan uh, to meet whatever goals and objectives they have. Uh, thank you very much for attending and please do uh, join us for our future webinars and um, please contact us with any questions. Thank you very much.